Good morning, everybody. It is good to be in the house of the Lord with you to worship and to gather together and all of that. So would you stand with us as we enter into our time of worship together through singing? grace is enough, isn't it? Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Take a seat. It's funny. I was like playing and looking out there and I was like doing the child check and I'm like, there's one missing. And then I was like, oh, he's back there. Thanks, Reuben, for helping us play with that song. You did such a good job. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. So glad to have you here today. As you can see, there's it looks different up here. 
Thank you, Dave, who worked so hard, and Sue, his right-hand woman, who helped clean up. It is, and Jim, yes. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. Thank you, guys, because it looks so nice and open up here, and we have lots of room so that I can get out my worship flags and dance. I was raised four square, so I have a fondness for worship flags. Anyway, um, so welcome to some things going on on our calendar. Today is not potluck day, so if you brought a whole food, you can take it back home and enjoy it. But um, next week is potluck, since we figured people would be out of town this week. So next week, bring all your goodies, bring all your things. Join us downstairs after service. And even if you can't bring anything, come because we're always like shoving food on people afterwards, trying to get them to take it home. So there's always extra. Just come and be with us and share in the meal. And because of that, then the very next week is going to be our communion Sunday where we all celebrate the gift of communion together in our service. And it's always just a really sweet and special time when we get to do that as a family together. So that will be the third week. Other things happening this week, uh, the Walls family is on vacation. I know it seems like Tim just got back. He just spent a whole week uh, conferencing with other pastors nationally, and he'll tell you all about that. Um, and then we're, we're glad to welcome our daddy back home, and then we're taking him away to the lake to go camping and fishing and boating all week long. So um, we will be out of town, but hopefully reachable by phone if you have an emergency. And um, Wednesday, there's still kids' church happening at Crossroad and Youth. And Thursday, there is still prayer happening here at 6 o'clock. Come and gather as a church family. And get on your knees and pray for our city and for our families. It's going to be all kinds of good stuff. All right, Pastor Tim, want to tell us about conference? Sure. <laughs> It'll be fun. Well, I bring greetings from the Western Conference and the whole rest of the denomination. Um, I was there. Uh, we arrived Monday night, um, blurry-eyed, ready to take on all the business sessions the next day, and, uh, and then that went through Thursday. So we're a part of a denomination. It's called the Evangelical Church. That harkens back to... Um, the Evangelical Association, which was a missionary movement out of Pennsylvania to um, come and uh, preach the gospel to German farming communities out here in the great Northwest. And so uh, we are, that's our heritage, even though uh, that was all kind of going on in the 1800s, we were planted in 1900 um, along with a lot of other uh, churches in Oregon at that time. I give all of that history to say uh, we're kind of at a crossroads as a denomination. Um, I haven't uh, mentioned it. I mentioned it a little bit to council and pastor parish committee. Um, I haven't gone at great length about it. I won't take a ton of time here in service because it might bore you a little bit. Um, and I, I want to get to the message because it kind of ties into all of this. But we're at a crossroads. And the reason, there's a couple of different reasons. One is that, um, uh, you know, as, uh, okay, we're not talking about that right now. Yep. Okay. The reason is because there are churches across the denomination that have been uh, closing down, like one at a time periodically, and we've been on a decline. Uh, across the board, we haven't seen uh, a lot of, disciples being made and people being uh, saved. We've seen it in some churches and less in others. And so uh, our general superintendent, who uh, oversees and just kind of is the spiritual covering over all our churches, um, he approached our regional superintendents and said, here's the situation, what should we do about it? And somebody had made the recommendation, well, hey, there's the missionary church. That's another denomination. Um, that's a global uh, group. Um, and they're doing good work. They, they line up with us really well. Maybe we should think about joining with them. 
We have a history of joining together with like-minded groups. Uh, so even though we started as the Evangelical Association, uh, we also at one point had joined with the United Brethren in Christ Church to form the Evangelical United Brethren Church. And that was from 1900 till 1950. Um, or, you know, 50, no, sorry, excuse me, 68. Um, when we officially formed, uh, we decided not to go with another merger that formed the United Methodist Church. And um, we said, there are some really crucial things that we can't compromise on. And so we will just decide to form our own group. And so pastors put their credentials on the line. Churches put their property on the line saying, we believe so strongly in this uh, that even if you take the building away, uh, we are still going to go forward because of those reasons. Well, now we're, you know, some 50 plus years later, and we're at another crossroads of people talking about merger. And so that was a big topic of discussion. Um, at conference this week, the general superintendent gave his um, opinion. We heard from the head of the missionary church. Um, there is a lot of good about the missionary church. Um, and I would also say, as your pastor, there's a lot of good about the evangelical church, um, our tribe, the, the one we belong to. Um, and for our region, our conference, we haven't made a decision yet. Um, we, uh, across America, we were made up of six conferences. Um, at the start of annual conference, we were down to two because two had already voted and decided, yes, we're going to go forward with that merger. Two are more than likely deciding assuming there's no big red flag and hiccup that they will be joining. And so it'll eventually, uh, in about six months or so, if all goes as it seems to be going, we'll be down to just two conferences, the Pacific Conference, which we belong to, and the Western Conference. Um, both of us are taking it slow, and we're trying to explore different options and things. and. Um, and so as a result of that, nothing is changing in that regard right now. We still belong to the evangelical church. In the coming uh, months and, and years, depending on how far this gets drug out, um, I'm going to be working with council to decide ultimately what's best for our church. Because the way this decision is getting made is that uh, there's about uh, four levels of things to consider. One is the denomination. Another is, you know, your district or your region, uh, the local church, and then the pastor, because my credentials are held with the denomination. And so um, I know that's a lot of information to throw at you, and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, if you have any questions about anything I just said, if you're deer in the headlights confused because you're like, I didn't even know you were a denomination. That's okay. Um, I am open to discussion, even though I'm going to be at the lake this week. Let's set up a time, and I would love to talk to you more about it. Um, not a lot else got decided, per se, at, at conference. It was more, uh, it was a check-in kind of time for us as a denomination. There was a lot of good and good discussions that came out of our time. Um, and I'm glad I went, even though uh, this was probably the last uh, general conference of its kind, uh, like we've seen it in the past. And so, whew, that being said, um, I think this is a cause for prayer. Uh, and we'll talk about prayer more in a little bit. But um, this is something to be praying about for our leaders, um, not just me, but... Uh, we have a superintendent. We have, uh, you know, uh, pastors like me around our group that are trying to weigh the options and trying to figure things out. And so that's all I have to share about General Conference. I'm glad I made it back. There were some turns in Idaho that were a little dicey, but we made it through. <laughs> Man, I, whew, 
northern Idaho, all those twists and turns. It is beautiful. He's right. It's true. I just, car sick. <laughs> Going like 70 miles an hour around some of those curves. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have to share about that. Um, so if you would uh, join me in prayer about that, that'd be great. Uh, you know, uh, and let's go ahead and continue in worship together. Will you stand with us again as we continue and worship through singing this morning? Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you, we turn to you, hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you, we yearn for you. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Come you here. 
every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Live for you. Open up my eyes in wonder and 
in you alone and I will not be shaken Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, 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 let the king my heart be the wind inside my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days oh he is my song you are good good Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down because you are good good Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. God Praise you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for 
Oh, Lord, you are such an amazing God. You are so faithful and loving. We praise you, Lord, for the blessings, the gifts, for your love, Lord, for all that you do. Just be with us, Lord, even more so for the rest of the service and throughout the week, Lord. Be with Tim as he brings your message. Help us to open our hearts and minds to what you have today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. You know, this last week, I was reminded of a psalm in the Bible that says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. You know, in this ancient song that none other than King Solomon, even though he acted a fool sometimes, it was said that he's the wisest man that ever lived. Um, but he really captured this important truth for us to remember. We can make any kind of plan we want. We can even go about making sure that we have all our ducks in a row, that it's going to happen, it's going to go exactly as we plan. But in the end, the only good way to build or even rebuild is to pray and seek the Lord's vision and the Lord's help. At that point, our work will maybe amount to a, a bunch of sweat and a bunch of excitement, but, you know, if we don't seek the Lord's help and the Lord's vision, then it won't really secure our future. It won't hold up in the long term before needing to go get help from someone from somewhere. And so, as Solomon would suggest, why not go to the one person that the Bible claims is our source for everything we need for life and godliness. The truth is we need to go to the Lord to ask for his help to help us build the house, right? Now, as I mentioned earlier about the merger stuff, don't worry, I won't go through all that hairy business, but one of the reasons why I, I'm more quick to pause and just say, let's, let's wait a minute, let's let's figure something out is because uh, all these talks that we had, even starting back at our annual conference business sessions in November, all of it was a bunch of talk. And we didn't start with prayer. And it wasn't until, oh, probably March or April that our conference superintendent said, you know what, we need to pray. Uh, this is a really big decision. There's a lot of division. Uh, even in our group of family of churches that we have here in the Northwest, there's a lot of opinions going around and we need to seek the Lord. And so it's my hope that as we move forward as a denomination, that we would seek the Lord first and let him establish our steps. And that would be my prayer for us as, as our own local church here on the corner of Laurel and Rhododendron. Now today, we are kicking off a brand new series, taking a pause away from Matthew. Uh, we'll get back to Matthew, don't worry. It'll stay there and, and we'll get there. But we're kicking off a new series where we're going to be exploring the first seven chapters of the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. Of the three different types of writings in the Hebrew scriptures, which are the law, the histories, and the writings, which also include all those poetry books that, you know, us pragmatic folk don't always like to go to, but they're there. Uh, so the law, the histories, and the writings, Nehemiah is historical. It's a history. It's a short history about a really crucial time for God's people. Jerusalem was sacked by the Babylonians, and most of the people had been carried off into exile 
to Babylon. And from there, the Babylonians were eventually sacked by the Persians. Uh, and it was under the Persian Empire that we eventually start to see God's people returning to the Promised Land. So although this was an amazing move of God to restore the people, they returned to find the aftermath and the rubble <clears throat> and the ruins of their country. To say thing, that things were in a bad way would be an understatement for them. And so what we're about to discover through this series is that people had the insurmountable task of trying to rebuild from the ruins. Rebuilding is a major theme of Nehemiah, and so we're going to call our series Rebuild uh, for the coming weeks. And so even though, you know, the circumstances are categorically different, uh, we're not literally building a wall uh, around our church building. We don't have, you know, a bunch of rubble around us to try to rebuild some kind of wall like these people did. The truth is we are standing at a moment in the life of our church where I believe there's a lot of good ahead for us. God's not done with us yet. And I believe that we need to rebuild, as it were. The pandemic really stopped a lot of momentum that we had going for us and we were experiencing as a church. And now that we are on the other side of all those shutdowns, I'm believing for no more, but you know, here we go. We're on the other side of a lot of those shutdowns. It's time for us, you and me, to see with fresh eyes, roll up our sleeves, and begin the process of rebuilding. But before we get started, the plan is to read what God has to say through the book of Nehemiah about what to do, how to do it, and ultimately what that will mean for us going forward. And so the title for today's message is Praying Through the Problem. Praying Through the Problem. Our main passage is going to be none other than Nehemiah 1, verses 1 through 11. And the big idea that we're going to be exploring together this morning is that God is always true to his people. God is always true to his people. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Nehemiah 1. I'll be reading from the New International Version today, but whatever version that you have in your hands is fine. Unfortunately, I don't have a digital copy to throw up on the screen here, but, um, you know, God's word doesn't return void, and so if you don't have a copy in front of you, just close your eyes and listen, and I believe God has something for you here today. Nehemiah 1, picking up in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year while I was in the citadel of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Yahweh, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. 
we have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cup bearer to the king. Friends, this is the word of the Lord recorded by Nehemiah. And the first observation I see in our passage is family and gathering facts. Family and gathering facts. So the book kicks off by giving us a lot of details, including some names that are mentioned. These people give shape to the historical account in a really unique way. First is the man named Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. The name Nehemiah means the Lord comforts. And his father's name means wait for God. Nehemiah's brother's, uh, Hananiah's name, comes from the Hebrew word that means to show favor or to be gracious to. Even God's own personal name, Yahweh, is mentioned here in the passage, which is signaled by the use of the word Lord in all capital letters in the English translation. Uh, God's name literally means that he is a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. God is so faithful, and the Bible always leads us to the place of seeing that he will never let us down, like we sung a little bit ago. No matter what, God does not let us down. God is always true. Now, in the Bible, names are important because they actually describe the person's character. At this point in the history of Israel, I always find it interesting what people's names mean, because it can often give us a clue into what they're like and what we can expect from them in their action. And, you know, it usually helps the histories come alive in a way that's lost to us in the present day, kind of like the old Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. Uh, he reaches the end of the song, and he says, and when I have a boy, I think I'll name him Bill or George or Frank, anything but Sue. You know, even though the name Sue is what gave him the rough and tumble grit that, you know, led him through life, right? Now, in today's world, though, if we were to name a boy Sue, you might assume that people were trying to make some kind of social or political statement, right? There, there might be a disconnect between names now of days. But the Lord comforts wait for God, show favor, be gracious. It looks like they could describe, those names could describe a family who was devout to God, or at least they used to be. And the names have been passed down from generation to generation, and that ultimately reminds us about God's character, that he is our comforter, that he is you know, worth the wait. He's, uh, he's the one we wait for and we expect for him to come through. He's faithful. The Lord is a gracious God and he's worthy of our trust. God makes promises and he keeps them. Nehemiah's family had been a part of the Babylonian exile in 586 BC. And 70 years later, they, you know, over time they'd gotten jobs, they built homes, they found a new life in a new place. And through the leadership of a priest named Ezra, many of God's people returned to the land and others stayed behind. Some of Nehemiah's family were probably part of the group that went back either in that first wave in 516 
uh, or maybe in a couple of other waves of return, returning exiles. But then others still stayed behind because they had built the life there in Persia. So Nehemiah gives us some details, though, that, uh, you know, that set up the, the picture of the story, right? Where it all began. It was in the month of Kislev. We all know what that is, right? Uh, well, I didn't know, so I had to look it up. Kislev in Hebrew and in that Israeli culture, uh, that would kind of correspond to our middle of November to the middle of December. That's kind of, you know, the season that we're looking at. Um, even though Persia is in the Middle East, you know, kind of geographically, uh, it probably, what is that, latitude along that line, it would probably be, you know, some high desert, but then there were also some, it, it would be kind of a little bit more like the climate we have here in a lot of ways, except for that we're on the coast. But anyway, I digress. So it's in the middle of November, middle of December. It might be cold at this point, right? This is in the 20th year of the reign of King Artaxerxes I of Persia, uh, which would set the time of this book at about 445 BC. That's 71 years after the first group of Jews returned to the promised land. And it was around this time that Nehemiah's brothers Hanani and some other people came to visit. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I check in with my folks in Portland, uh, if it's either in person or by phone, uh, if it's going to be a long talk at all, we usually get around to me asking the question, hey, how is so-and-so doing? Um, and catching up on the condition of my family. So let's get the details. Let's gather the facts about the state of the family. That's what Nehemiah is doing in verses 1 through 3. The facts he's most interested in could be summed up in two categories. The first is, how is the Jewish remnant who survived the exile. How are they doing? How are the people? And number two, what is Jerusalem like? Um, it's quite possible that Nehemiah was born in exile, uh, just within the time frame that we're looking at here. Um, Nehemiah's connection with the promised land was 141 years removed from seeing the great city. And so his outlook is really wrapped up in the answers to those two questions, which we learn that the remnant were in trouble, they were disgraced, and this was because the walls had been demolished and at the Babylonian invasion, and they were still in ruin, and that left the city unprotected, vulnerable, and exposed to dangers from attack. The great thing about having family and gathering the facts is that once you have a general idea of what things are really like, it's in that place that you can really know how to respond. God is always true to his people, and that's why they ended up in the promised land in the first place. That's also why they ended up in exile and returning there again. God's faithfulness is also why we see this moment in Nehemiah's story. So, what happened next? In verse 4, it said, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. This shows me another important factor in the story of rebuilding uh, is that we need to process our emotions. We need to process our emotions. When Nehemiah heard the news, he didn't come at it from a place of thinking that he had all the answers, you know, saying things like, well, what the people in Jerusalem really need to do is X, Y, Z, and then everything will be good. He didn't complain about this news. He didn't condemn his out-of-town guests, saying things like, well, why didn't you do something about it? Nehemiah is a great example of what we should do when we are faced with a major problem in life. He went through a time of processing his emotions, which in this case was his grief over the state of the people and the city. This year, 
and even the last couple of years in the pandemic have been a full-on change, uh, you know, full of change, stress, and even some loss for a lot of us. People have moved, spouses have separated or even divorced, families have been divided over all hosts of issues. Uh, there's some of us who have experienced the death of a loved one or some of us who have, you know, these changes and more have happened and we were just, you know, passive participants in it. We were bystanders uh, because of one reason or another. The question is, are we processing through those emotions? Or are we living in denial? Or worse yet, are we letting our emotions consume us to the point of wrecking us even further? Friends, you are a human being made in the image of God, and God gave you emotions. And when you process through those emotions, that is going to lead you to a better place of understanding and even a place of being healed and restored, coming out on the other side stronger than before. So how do we process through emotions? Uh, a couple of things to take note of. The first step is to acknowledge what the emotion is. Acknowledge what the emotion is. What are you feeling? It's not wrong to feel something. In case you needed to hear that this morning, it's okay to feel. We don't have to be stoic all the time. It's okay to feel. Your emotions are just the natural way your bodies, especially your mental capacity, responds to something. It's okay to feel because once you've identified that you're feeling that way, that's when those details are out in the open and you can actually deal with what's happening. We have to be honest about our emotions in order to really deal with them. The second step in that process is to own your emotion. To own your emotion. Own what's yours and what's not. This is where you move from just talking about it or even just feeling those feelings to actually owning your part of those feelings. When processing through those emotions, we can't shift the blame to somebody else for how you are feeling, how I'm feeling. Since we're the only ones who are internalizing these feelings and maybe even expressing our feelings, we have to own what that feeling is telling us about that situation. The third step is to accept the emotion. Accept the emotion. You've identified it. You've gotten real about the fact that, yep, I'm feeling this way. This is what it's telling me about where I'm at with what I'm feeling. And this is the step. Acceptance is the step where we, we accept the emotions for what they are. Our emotions are not absolute truth. And they only become objective reality when we start to act on them in the world. To accept the emotion means to recognize that this is what I'm feeling. This is why I'm feeling it and I'm actually feeling it, and to then realize that it does not have to necessarily define my reality. And the fourth and final step is to give it away. Give away the emotion. This is the end of the process, the end of the line. This is the step where we find some conclusion to the conflict that we're feeling through practicing things like forgiveness, reconciliation, or release. And some questions that help us release that emotion and to move on in life are, number one, is what I'm getting emotional about something that's actually happening right now? Or is it just something that I'm feeling about some distant memory that I'm being reminded about now? Another question would be, if it's something that is in the past, is it something that we released before, but we find ourselves going and picking it back up again? If so, then it's possible that we did not really accept and own our emotions earlier on in the process, and we have to go back and back, back to those steps and start to walk through that. That's one of the reasons why there's a lot of times in our lives where we can feel guilt and shame 
over sin that was already dealt with in the past, things that, you know, maybe wrongs that we did or wrongs that were done to us, and we feel that in the present. And so in order to release them, we have to identify, is that a now thing or was it a then thing? And has that actually been dealt with? Do I need to go back and try to work through those steps again? Third, and, and this is kind of the third group of questions to consider, it brings us to the question of, is that a place of sin? With our feelings, are we in a place where we need to go to God to forgive us and heal us of, you know, those damages that sin has done to our life. In order that we can move on from that place of emotion, we need God to help us, to give it away so that we're free to go forward without having to feel like we're just getting stuck in the process on a loop. Now, that was a lot of information to cover. Thank you for bearing with me. That's a, you know, a process that uh, I was led through in a leadership de development thing. So let's filter Nehemiah's experience and see if we can see him processing through his emotions in the passage. Step one, he acknowledged, uh, he heard the information, it came to him, and his body naturally responded. He sat down and wept. He was overcome with emotion. All his hopes and expectations of news from the promised land were dashed by the reality of what was, and this caused him to feel sad. Step two, he owned his emotions. It was his sadness at the news that caused him to sit down and weep. Nehemiah practiced solitude in the aftermath of his brother's words. Step three, he accepted the emotions and his solitude. He fasted. He took a posture of being physically empty in that place of sadness. Instead of just trying to self-medicate through filling his life with all manner of substances or distractions, he practiced fasting so that he could become laser-focused on processing through this emotion. And finally, the fourth step, giving it away, is seen in how Nehemiah went on to pray to God. Processing through his emotions, ultimately he looked to God for help and resolution to go forward. He didn't just get with his brothers and talk it through, you know, solving all the world's problems. Instead, he took his emotion to God in prayer because God is always true to his people. And when Nehemiah's heart was overwhelmed, he practiced solitude and fasting and prayer. And it would be from that place that he would come out stronger and able to face the issue head on and begin the process of rebuilding going forward. All right, third and final thing. I see Nehemiah doing is that he participates through prayer and waiting. He participates through prayer and waiting. The rest of the chapter, it has a prayer that Nehemiah wrote out to God. Before we can move on to the, the point of rebuilding, whether it's for ourselves, for our church, for our family, for where, you know, whatever area we have had loss, in, we need to go to God in prayer. We may recognize that there's a problem, that something needs to happen, but we need to have God's wisdom and direction. Nehemiah was a person of prayer, and throughout the book, we see that Nehemiah's default response, any time he faces any kind of opposition or problem of any kind, is to go to the Lord in prayer. Nehemiah prays through the problem, because the truth is, when you want to and need to rebuild, prayer is absolutely essential to that work. Because like Solomon wrote in the Psalms, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And so in Nehemiah's prayer, he follows a similar pattern uh, that a lot of believers use today. People go by different things, but it's usually a, a similar acronym, uh, acrostic. Uh, I like to call it the pray pattern, um, and we see it in Nehemiah 1. So first, he praises God, P for praise. Uh, he praises God for who he is and what he's done. 
he recognizes, you know, God, you are the Lord in heaven, and, and you have rescued and redeemed your people. He reflects and he repents of the things in life that fall short of God's holiness by literally saying in which verse is it in verse six he says i confess the sins we israelites including myself and my father's family have committed against you he confesses he repents of that then he goes on to ask god he brings his request to him a for ask when you face a problem you go to god and you ask him for help and the last letter, Y, for yield, we, we yield to his will and his timing. There's about a four-month gap between the time that Nehemiah first heard this news from his brothers that Jerusalem was in ruin and that the people were discouraged to when we see Nehemiah take his problem to King Artaxerxes. That means that Nehemiah was in deep, prayer for about four months leading up to the action, which suggests to me that through all that time of prayer and fasting, Nehemiah was waiting on the Lord to give the green light to move forward because God is always true to his people. And when we wait on the Lord, he will place us on the right path. And so, to conclude, the challenge I want to give you and me today is to pray. We are facing a season where we need to rebuild. There's no doubt about that. Definitely, as a church, we need to do it. And maybe for you individually, and for me individually, maybe we need to personally rebuild. And the challenge is not to just go about trying to fix the problems that we're facing. Instead, we kind of follow the pattern like Nehemiah shows us. Gather the facts. Process through your emotions. And participate through prayer and waiting. The main action that we're called to in Nehemiah 1 is to pray. So if we are to rebuild, let's start right. Amen? Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we magnify your name today. We praise you and we worship you, holy and awesome God, who loved us so much that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to live a perfect life and die on the cross in our place to pay for our sins. God, right now, we we reflect on our lives. We think about areas that either we haven't brought to you before or things that we haven't let go of. God, please forgive us for our wrongs. Help us to know the freedom that comes with forgiveness. And God, we ask for the season ahead for us as a church, as we look at just the idea of rebuilding, that God, you could do some new thing here, some fresh work that would, that would restore your glory and, and the testimony of your name here at the corner of Laurel and Rhododendron. God, we ask for you to move. We ask for you to speak. We ask for you to make things clear for us, to know which way we should go, how we should proceed, and also how to work together in unity, because we know, God, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And so, Lord, would you help us as our own little local church, help us to stay unified on you. Help us to cling to the cross. Help us to cling to your word. Help us to cling 
to your name, your goodness, and your kindness towards us. God, ultimately, we yield our lives to you. God, we surrender to your will and your way for our life. God, you have a plan, and we want to get on board with that plan. Help us when it is hard, and it and that plan challenges whatever perfect plan I think I might have or that my brothers and sisters might think they have. Lord, help us in that place of surrender. And ultimately, God, we give this day to you. We give this upcoming week to you. God, we celebrate the freedom that we get to have as Americans in this great country. And yet we also we reflect and we ask for your help for all the things that we've been talking about this morning, that you would also help us as a country rebuild on you. God, you are so good to us. We thank you for your mighty hand and outstretched arm in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. Would you stand with me and get ready to be blessed? <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us today. I know it's a holiday weekend and you could be anywhere else in the world, but you chose to come here this morning at 11 o'clock. And I am so grateful to get to fellowship with you, to get to see your beautiful faces and open the word together. And I really hope you have a great 4th of July weekend. <clears throat> so as we go from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Have a great week.